Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome again to McLean Hospital Grand Rounds. Um, today's Grand Rounds, as you can tell by the image, is a special Grand Rounds, the Joseph P. Powers Memorial Lectureship. It is my honor and privilege to introduce today's lecture in remembrance and celebration of our colleague, Dr. Powers. He was a beloved member of McLean Hospital as the director of group psychotherapy for many years. A man of profound devotion and compassion for people, he dedicated his life's work to patient care by using his skills and expertise in group psychotherapy to create spaces of empathy and inclusion where people could meet, heal, and grow. It is in this spirit that we honor Dr. Power's legacy by inviting experts in the field of psychotherapy to present on topics related to his critical work. I would like to recognize that the Joseph P. Powers Memorial Lectureship is made possible through the, the generosity of Dr. Powers' family, friends, and colleagues. We thank them for keeping his legacy alive through this wonderful lectureship. And now it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Sherry Marmroth. Dr. Marmroth is a professor at Divine Mercy University and director of their newly established International Center for the Psychology of Spirituality and Mental Health. She's currently collaborating with researchers here at McLean Hospital, studying spirituality, mental health, and the brain. And she's also collaborating with doctors at Mass General and Dana-Farber to develop an app that will facilitate the well-being of patients diagnosed with incurable cancer. Dr. Marmarash is an associate professor of clinical psychology at the George Washington University, where she's been for 18 years studying how attachment relates to coping with oppression, ruptures, and the repairs in the therapy alliance and outcome in individual and group treatment. And it's my pleasure to turn the conference over to Dr. Marmarash. I've got to stop sharing my screen so she can share hers. Thanks. Thank you so much for that introduction. I'm honored to be here today and so excited to be talking about something that is very important to me is the uh, attachment and looking at how it relates to group psychotherapy and to improving inpatient care. And I do also, I, I want to honor the work of Dr. Joseph Powers. Um, uh, I was uh, pleasantly surprised to see that he also did his training in psychodrama at the Moreno Institute, where my mentor in group psychotherapy also did his training. Um, and I, I just love the work he did to bring group to children and adolescents. And I, I think he would be proud of the work we've been trying to do with attachment and looking at how attachment can relate to group psychotherapy. One of the things that I think is so important uh, is that, you know, groups are probably the most common intervention in hospital settings. One of my colleagues, Martin Whittingham, is um, doing a lot of work to promote group psychotherapy and alter people's sense of uh, value of group psychotherapy by challenging kind of the reimbursement rates and looking at where people are using group therapy. And hospital settings are one of the places where we see groups the most. So I wanted to ask you, I've never done this before, but I thought I would ask you a question. I I think there's a way to do a poll of the audience and ask how many of you, um, if yes or no, are you currently leading a therapy group? So fascinating. Look how it changes. This is really live. <laughs> Very interesting. Wow. Okay. So some of you are, and, and a lot of you are not leading therapy groups. I hope by the end of this, I can uh, change that. Maybe I can put some one of the things I, uh, is also important is that groups require specific knowledge and training. So I was president of Division 49, which is the division devoted to group psychotherapy in the American Psychological Association. And one of the things that took a long time was actually promoting groups to specialty status. And they require a lot of training, but often clinicians who are doing group work don't have the training. I know in our graduate program, uh, group psychotherapy is an elective and it's not a required core course in many programs. Um, and so I was wondering in this audience, if you are doing group, um, how many of you who are doing group work have actually had any formal training in group work? That's really great to see, because I think a lot of the programs I've seen have not had that. So that's great to see those results. 
Um, one of the things that's important to acknowledge is that regardless of the type of orientation you're using with group psychotherapy, whether you're doing CBT, um, DBT, mentalized-based treatments, whether you're doing compassion-focused, emotion-focused, interpersonal psychoanalytic or positive psychology, all you're going to see group dynamics and attachment influencing the group process. And, and one of the things I want to share, so I was um, collab I am collaborating with um, Dr. David Rossmarin here, and he did a fabulous intervention on uh, looking at how to add spirituality to patients and treatment at McLean. And in the data set, he was very generous to allow one of my grad students to actually look at what was the qualitative feedback of the intervention. So we pulled people, so out of thousands of patients who who participated in the intervention at McLean, we looked at around 300 of them who said, I, this was extremely helpful to me. And so these are the people who really benefited from the intervention. And then we looked at the qualitative data from that sample. And almost all of the feedback was about the group dynamics. I wish the leader had stopped people from dominating the group. I wish that some people weren't quiet and the leader had addressed some of the people were silent. Um, I wish that, that we had more time to process some of the things that we were talking about and have more discussion. Um, a lot of the feedback was around the boundaries. It was around the process. It was around preparation for the, the intervention. So even though the intervention was very successful at doing what it was set to do, the group dynamics still influenced the process. Regardless of the structure, so even in a more structured group versus an interpersonal process group, we see the group dynamics and attachments regardless of the disorder being treated. So in a homogenous groups, you may see groups that have, everyone has the same issue, whether it's substance use, an eating disorder, a mood disorder, or if it's a heterogeneous group where people come together and have different diagnoses, but may all have something in common like relationship difficulties. And regardless of the setting, whether you're doing inpatient work, outpatient clinic, private practice, or telegroup therapy, you do see the group dynamics. And one of the things I'm going to talk about a lot later at the very end of my um, presentation today is some of the research we're doing in our in a, a GW's clinic is looking at attachment and how it relates to telegroup therapy. Because one of our uh, the things we've noticed is that some patients actually prefer online group therapy and they actually feel less pressure and have done very well, as opposed to some patients who've really struggled with the distance and the lack of eye contact. And so they've had a harder time with the telegroup therapy. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about how attachment may relate to that as well. So today what I'm going to do, usually I do workshops on attachment and group therapy. So it's, I'm going to really do a very simplified view of attachment and then apply it to groups. I'm going to really focus on patients. So a patient's attachment, how that may influence their experience of group. I'm going to focus on group leadership or the therapist and what they bring to the group. And then I'm going to focus on the systemic issues because attachment theory has been um, applied to groups and attachment to groups and larger systemic issues, especially looking at microaggressions and ruptures in group that might be about other identities or experiences of intergenerational trauma that people bring into the group as well, and then provide some recommendations for therapists who are leading groups. Um, one of the things that is important to acknowledge is the difference between outpatient and inpatient group therapy, and, and you all are experts at this. Um, and I did do some group work at um, Central State Hospital in Petersburg, Virginia, and I was on an adolescent unit. And one of the things that was really different than the group work I'm doing now where I supervise students who are leading groups in our community mental health clinic is the limited amount of screening time and prep for group. You know, a lot of times patients really have to go into a group and there isn't a lot of time to prepare them or screen for patients to be in group. And I think that has a lot of influence in what happens in, in, in any kind of therapy group. There's also frequent interruptions to groups. So patients may have other appointments or other things happening that interrupt the group. Um, there's also the space limitations. Some hospitals may say, you know, we, we put the group into this location and it may not be um, uh, as boundaried as other spaces or the consistent space. One of the things I think was the most challenging was this one, which I highlighted, was the frequent discharge and having new patients joining. So each week the group was like a new group. 
right? So you have some patients coming in, some patients leaving. And from an attachment perspective, you're seeing a lot of activation of loss, grief, abandonment, and that change. And um, that can be very difficult for some group members. Um, and I think that stands out as being very different than the stability you may have in outpatient groups or in private practice groups. Um, you also see patients with different levels of functioning in the same group. So some patients may be higher functioning and able to do more in a personal work and some patients who are really struggling um, and not able to, to cope with some of that stress. You see people suffering with different symptoms, some more severe. You also have patients who are starting medications. So sometimes medications impact their ability to be present or engaged. They might be um, more um, cognitively less aware or able to be present in the group. And also people leaving the group and interacting on the unit. I, I usually think of when inpatient group being more like family therapy, because you may have ruptures that happened before people came into the group because of things that happened on a unit. And then they come into the group or something happens in the group and then they bring it out onto the unit. And so that is more like um, the less boundary than you might see in a private practice setting or an outpatient clinic. Um, and then there are systemic issues that influence the group. So some things about the unit and the leadership on the unit and the dynamics of the group that is bigger than what's happening in the therapy group. So all of those things are influencing your patients. This is a study in, um, by um, Bernard Strauss in Germany. And it's an older study, but I really like it. I hope it sets the tone of kind of the importance of group, of uh, looking at attachment in a hospital setting. Um, these researchers, what they did is they evaluated 617 inpatients who were in nine different hospitals in Germany. They gave them a symptom checklist when they came in, and then they also gave them this questionnaire, which is a self-reported attachment expectation toward a therapist, right, toward their therapist. And they combine all the patients, so very similar to McLean, where you'd have a lot of patients with different disorders, similar to the work that David Rossman did with the um, spirit intervention. Almost all the treatment was group oriented, and it lasted only 10 weeks, so pretty short treatment. And basically, one of the main findings was that the secure patients indicated the greatest benefit from the inpatient group therapy in most of the outcome measures, while there was a lot less um, success for an more anxiously, more avoidantly attached patients. So again, giving some credence to how attachment might influence the process of the treatment that they're receiving on an inpatient unit. Um, I wanna give some credit to my co-authors. So the book that we wrote was Attachment and Group Psychotherapy, and that goes into much more depth than what I'm gonna do today. I'm going very, very, um, surface just to kind of maybe uh, inspire you to, to want to look more deeply into attachment. Um, and this book covers much more of the depth. Um, before I start, I wanted to do another one of these stories. Are you familiar with attachment theory? So I don't know how many of you out there are pretty familiar with it. Well, so most of you are familiar with all these works. I don't have to go too much into the depth, so um, I can say a little bit more. But the basic premise of the attachment system for Bowlby is to keep the vulnerable infant in close proximity during danger to promote survival. And there's two ongoing processes that are going to be occurring that are um, uh, important is the, the ability of, to feel secure and to downregulate distress, which is safety, right? So, and a lot of the safety is via attunement and emotion regulation from a primary caregiver. Um, exploration is what happens when you can downregulate distress and you're regulated, which is exploration, which is curiosity, which could be looking around or engaging the environment or play or creativity, um, which is learning. Right. Um, and then if you have children, you're aware that, you know, a lot of times kids will go off and play and if something frightens them, they'll come back to the secure base of any caregiver, right? It may not be their uh, biological parent, but it could be a caregiver that is their secure base and that will downregulate the distress and then they resume exploration. The important part is that a caregiver can't always provide felt security so that the distress can remain high and then affect regulation needs to become primary. And this is important because whenever I'm teaching with my students, it, it may not be 
the caregiver doesn't want to be attuned or it, that they don't love their child, but that there may be other reasons why they cannot be a, uh, regulating distress. So for example, in a situation where there is trauma like war, or if the caregiver is ill, or if there's poverty or other situations, there may be a lot of reasons or mental health concerns the caregiver can't be attuned. And so the child has to find some way to adapt to the environment. And so these are really actually very adaptive strategies that children engage in to make the best of the situation they're in. One of them is to um, try to get and elicit the caregiving as best they can. And so if they try harder, if they stay in close proximity, they may be able to get more of those emotional needs met, but that means they have to be very vigilant towards the caregiver. So what happens, we call this under-regulation, is the exploration decreases because the primary emphasis becomes being kind of close to the caregiver for that safety and emotion regulation. So it's at the expense of play or exploration, the focus is being hypervigilant to being with the other, right? I think if you think about Sidney Blatt's work, this is much more similar to the analytic position, somebody who's very relational. Overregulation. So in, if there is an ability to do that, a child really isn't going to be able to elicit the caregiving. Um, the next best strategy is to become self-sufficient as a way of coping with the distress because you can't stay in that emotionally dysregulated place. The next best thing is to find some strategy that isn't relational to downregulate distress. So then exploration becomes very organizing. So relying on distraction from distress is an, a very successful strategy to cope with one's distress. So in the strange situation, which I'm not gonna get into, these infants, when their caregiver leaves, they um, do not appear distressed. They don't elicit caregiving. But if you measure the heart rate, if you measured their stress response, the cortisol levels are very elevated. So they are in distress, but they've learned to be self-sufficient and focus on the play to distract themselves from their feelings. Internal working models can win the hallmarks of what we do in psychotherapy when we're using uh, thinking about attachment theory, which is kind of this affective and cognitive component to the repeated attachment cycles around exploration and safety, right? So they become internal working models, the way you think about yourself and what you think about others. They're actually scripts of expectations for what are others going to be doing in relationship to yourself in times of distress. A lot of times these are out of awareness. So a lot of my patients may not have an awareness of why they think this way or where this comes from. But a lot of this is happening when right brain functioning is primary. So it's interesting, you know, that they may not actually have the language to know why a fight or flight response gets kicked in or there is an immediate detachment from affect. And so an examples of internal working models and scripts would be, I am loved, others are kind. I expect support when I'm distressed versus I'm worthless, others are rejecting, I can't burden others with my needs. These scripts and schemas are often what we focus on in therapy and in group therapy, um, because what we're trying to do is give patients a different experience where they learn to revise their internal working models. And so you can see that attachment can go in conjunction with cognitive behavioral therapy, it can go with DBT therapy, or even psychoanalytic or psychodynamic models as well. Um, a lot of people often wonder, you know, well, how reliable is infant attachment and in looking at development? You know, like we're talking about something early, there's a lot of things that might influence adult psychopathology. And one of my favorite books is by Alan Truth and his colleagues who, um, which is the development of the person. It's really based on the research and attachment from the, their longitudinal work. It's pretty amazing research because they actually tracked 200 infants for 30 years, they still keep tracking these people, um, which is amazing to be able to see mothers and measuring their attachment when they're pregnant, looking at the infant's attachment, then looking all the way till these people are having infants and looking at how this relates. So what's interesting is they did find a link between secure infant attachment and the ability to regulate emotions and less psychopathology later in life. Um, but what's most important is that the most at risk individuals were the disorganized attachment during infancy. So infants who, uh, the disorganized attachment is the one where infants um, uh, 
uh, had more, uh, more paralyzed, dissociated in the strain situation, there's more linking to trauma and fear of the caregiver. And they had correlations that with disorganized attachment in infancy and psychiatric problems at the age of 17, increased use of substances, marital hostility, and increased rates of borderline personality disorder as well. There's been a lot of um, applications of attachment to psychotherapy um, and in many different ways, ranging from uh, more psychoanalytic ways of thinking about attachment, which is like Wallen's work and also Peter Fonge's work to attachment in um, couples therapy with Sue Johnson, which does not look at the past at all and is very focused on emotion focused treatment. So you have very different ways of applying attachment and hopefully some of the work I'll talk about today will be relatable to the work you're doing in groups. In addition, attachment has an enormous research background supporting it. There's a lot of empirical support. McCall and Cern Shaver are both social psychologists, but they do a lot of writing within the clinical fields and um, have done an amazing job putting together um, the findings from hundreds and hundreds of studies linking attachment to mental illness, ranging from attachment to anxiety, depression, PTSD, eating disorders, personality disorders and relationship difficulties. So uh, in any of the different units on the claim, I'm sure that there's a way that attachment would relate in, in the research findings. So I'm gonna shift gears a little and talk about how you, if you were interested in measuring attachment, you would be able to do this easily. Um, and, and then using that to kind of talk about the different dimensions and how that might apply to the group therapy. Um, one of the debates, I guess, in the field is how do you measure attachment? And I would have to say the gold standard is the adult attachment interview. Um, however, it's a very difficult um, process to be trained in and is very time consuming. So if you were in a situation like in a hospital setting where you needed to maybe make decisions about treatment quickly um, and you don't have a long time to really um, do that, you can use self-reports to assess. Now they're different. There was a really interesting study looking at fMRIs of people when they were um, answering questions on the adult attachment interview versus these self-report questionnaires and different parts of the brain light up. So when you're filling out the adult attachment where you're, you're answering questions about the adult attachment interview about your history and your parents or your caregivers, the amygdala and more emotional regulating parts of the brain are activated when you're doing self-report. It's the prefrontal cortex. So it's a lot more what's in your awareness. So there is a difference, but I think it's really important that you can get something out of this. And I find it very useful in our clinical work with our patients. So the experience in close relationship scale, this is a short form that people have access to. It's 12 items, very easy to give to patients. Um, it taps two dimensions. I try avoiding people are avoiding getting close, which is more of the attachment avoidance and attachment anxiety, which is worrying that uh, people won't be there for them or feeling abandoned or neglected. The other thing that I'm happy to share with you if you are interested in this, this is the group therapy questionnaire by Rebecca McNair and Jack Corzini. And this is, uh, this is one of my favorite assessments. I do give this out pre-group. It can be used for pre-group screening or pre-group preparation. But it's a helpful because it does have similar items to the adult attachment interview. And I'm going to show you some examples of things patients have shared um, from this and how it could be useful information in a group to um, as far as uh, expectations for what may unfold in a therapy group. So the two dimensions I talked about before, um, when you're scoring and when you're talking about it, uh, in the research findings, which I'm gonna talk about too, it's important to understand the two dimensions. So you have anxiety, which are concerns about being abandoned and rejected, and that is on your horizontal axes. And then you have avoidance, which is prefer self-sufficiency, less emotionally expressive, and uh, more likely to withdraw, right, as a way of coping. And that is your um, vertical axes. And so if you were to look at this, what's nice about a dimensional approach versus putting someone in a category is that there's a lot of diversity around people who are anxious more or secure. Um, and this allows for some flexibility. So a person could have more avoidance, but still be a secure, securely attached person. 
The other nice piece about having the dimensions is that for change in psychotherapy, it's a lot more helpful to see that you could move someone to less anxiety or less avoidance versus trying to aim to move someone from one category to another. So you're going to move them from so an insecure attachment to a secure attachment. Um, big changes can occur by just shifting people down on attachment anxiety, for example, or, in, or decreasing avoidance. So when we're scoring these, a secure attachment ends up being in the upper left quadrant. These are people who are low on anxiety and low on avoidance. I always use this in, in when I'm training students because I teach a course on attachment and psychotherapy. And um, one of the things I like to tell people is that people can have a valence for anxiety and avoidance, right? So when you're teaching um, or thinking about therapists, um, even if we have secure attachments, we still can have a valence for fears of what other people think and wanting to be liked versus preferring to be self-sufficient and then pulling back when feelings are intense. And I think that's important because that influences your countertransference. It influences how you interact with the patient um, and how you might deal with termination, how you deal with patients who don't come to a session or are challenging you or having conflict and how you might navigate the ruptures that may happen in a psychotherapy situation. So it also influences therapists. Secure individuals, this is a quick summary. Um, in, in a lot of the research comes from the Collins or Shaver, but a lot, there's so many different research. Some of it's social sites, some of it's more clinical. Um, what we see for secure individuals is they tend to know when to disclose and when not to. So they're not as likely to be um, just over disclosing too soon. The important piece is they're able to forgive more easily because of their internal representation of being of other people being more benevolent. Um, if someone does something that's hurtful, it's easier for them to forgive. A lot of the social psych research has shown how they're better caregivers when another person is distressed. They tend to be more empathic and they have a capacity to tolerate conflict and talk about negative feelings. So Susan Woodhouse did this research and they were looking at transference and they were expecting that in therapy, patients who were had insecure attachments would be more negative or say more negative things about their therapist. But it was actually the more secure patients that felt comfortable saying, I didn't like this, or this is not something I like. They actually are the ones that were talking more honestly about what they felt. And then Peter Fonagy talks a lot about attachment and reflective capacity and epistemic trust. And so patients who have more secure attachments also tend to have the capacity to take another person's perspective. And they're also able to hold onto their experience and hear a different experience at the same time. Right? They don't feel as um, overwhelmed or fearful if someone says something that could change or take over their experience. And they have a basic trust in others. So they're able to learn from others or take in information, which is epistemic trust. And Diana Fosha talks about how they're able to feel and deal at the same time. And I think this makes sense. This is why they are patients who do much better in group therapy. And it's important actually to have patients in your group that have more secure attachment. An example of a more secure group member, um, this is an example of a patient that would look more secure in a group. So MM is a 40 year old black bisexual cisgender female. She came to the hospital after a serious depressive episode with suicidal ideation. It did not take long for her to develop an alliance with her doctors, and she took her medication. She easily engaged with members, was able to explore her fears of having depression, since this was something that was a genetic vulnerability in her family. She was curious about others, empathized with members, was able to reflect on the interactions, was able to talk about her frustrations with being on the unit, things that upset her, um, leader misunderstandings. She was able to assert herself and she was able to forgive members when they made an assumption about her sexual identity. Um, most importantly, she was not overwhelmed by the group process, the things that happened in the group she could tolerate. The next uh, quadrant is the preoccupied. So these are patients on the upper right quadrant. And so these are patients who are gonna be high on anxiety, but low on avoidance. Right? So the more preoccupied patients. I would have to say in our clinical research, most of the patients coming in to our community mental health clinic are high in anxiety um, and are in the either preoccupied or fearful quadrants. Um, these are patients who also endorse a lot of symptoms when they come in. So when they fill out the HCL-90, they, they fill out a lot of um, symptoms. 
Um, one of the things they'll notice too is they attempt to reduce anxiety by minimizing distance. They try to solicit displays of uh, caregiving and support from others and unfortunately are often feeling disappointed. They don't always feel like, even though they try, they don't feel like they got what they need. Um, and so they're often frustrated with the caregiving. Um, people in this quadrant, more preoccupied individuals um, may be more likely to be flooded with emotions. So if they start to feel something, it may uh, trigger other feelings, past experiences, tend to be harder on themselves, more self-critical, more symptomatic. Um, one of the important ones is they're less empathic. In group therapy, this is one of the hardest pieces, I think, some of the patients I've had, because they do have their own feelings and they do relate with other one, other people in the group's feelings, but because they're so self-focused on eliciting caregiving and their own distress, they actually aren't very good at always listening to other people's pain. Um, often have a difficult time forgiving, can be more jealous and preoccupied. Um, a lot of the research looking at... Um, uh, spousal abuse or uh, stalking behavior is people are higher on preoccupied, um, sensitive to abandonment and rejection. So they feel a significant amount, but have a harder time dealing and thinking and coping with their feelings. An example would be PM is a 28 year old white heterosexual female. She came to the hospital after her parents noticed her binging. She was diagnosed with both binge eating disorder and depression. She said that she was fine in the group, but later revealed fears of abandonment and rejection. She's able to link her eating at times she's alone. So when she's alone, that's when she starts to binge. She was uncertain if others really understood or cared about her and appeared to be more cautious in the group, struggled to say what she was thinking or feeling in the group, um, tendency to take care of others and prioritize other people's needs over her own needs, but did appear to benefit from the group and especially from the group's co cohesion and eventually binging decreased over time. And I'm gonna talk about some research that George Tasker's group's done on binge eating disorder, eating disorders in group. Dismissing are individuals who tend to be low on anxiety and high in avoidance. This is the opposite quadrant from the preoccupied. So they are very high in avoidance. Um, they can appear very self-reliant. These are patients that often do not report a lot of symptomatic. Um, they can do more uh, somatizing. So coming in with migraines, body aches, back aches. Um, versus uh, emotional pain. Dismissing individuals tend to value independence and achievement, devalue dependency and vulnerability. Um, oftentimes prefer thinking to feeling. And so feeling can be very difficult for them to identify what they're feeling inside. Uncomfortable with group cohesion, um, poor memories of childhood, and they tend to deal but don't feel very well the harder time knowing what they're feeling or how to deal with that. Um, what's important about the group cohesion, I remember in my training, I, uh, I always learned that group cohesion was important for everybody. And actually it's very difficult for patients who are higher in avoidance. And actually that's um, a challenging time for them in a group. So a clinical example would be a 25 year old white cisgender male who came to the hospital after a breakdown at home. He reported suicidal thoughts and anger after his girlfriend broke up with him had a history of aggressively acting out when drinking. His individual therapist said he revealed feeling uncomfortable with the group and did not want to continue. He said he didn't need to hear about everyone's problems and he also didn't want their pity. Said that his suicidal thoughts were resolved and didn't need the medication, he was fine. In the group, Cam often competed with the leader, was less empathic to others and minimized his drinking and mental health concerns. He did benefit from hearing other people share their alcohol struggles, especially others who are more avoidant. So there was something important about being with people who he understood, who he felt he understood what they were, um, going, the way they coped and preferred structured interventions in the group. So this is an example. I told you about the group therapy questionnaire, and I wanted to pull an example of somebody um, who was higher on avoidance and, um, and non-anxiety so that you could kind of see what it looks like. So the, the items on here, it may be hard for you to read, so I'll read it, but it's very small print. Um, it's how did your parents show they're caring for you? And he wrote in yelling at me, father, neglecting me, mother. And that was how they showed caring. And children play different roles in their family. What role did you play? You wrote victim. Describe your mother, neglectful. Describe your father, frustrated and angry. How did your parents show their anger at you? Father, yell and strike. 
mother didn't wasn't around and then how did you express your anger crying um what's really fascinating is the diagram he did right so in the diagram you're told it can be helpful if you use placement to depict closeness and size to reflect status so it's fascinating in my class we always talk a lot about the diagrams i have a lot of examples from patients and they're so useful in thinking about how a patient might experience the leader or the group. And what's interesting is he wrote his dad is a huge uh, rectangle that's not even completely closed, but a big, large rectangle. And you see three of these large kind of arrows going down on him. And what's fascinating is that he wrote himself as a circle, which is more like the women that were in his life. He also he identified more with them. He also has his mother as the smallest circle, which is out in space. I don't know if I move this, if you see it. I don't know if you can see this, or I'm going to do it. I don't know if you see it. Um, but this is the smaller circle. This is his biological mother. But he has this relationship. The only one of the relationships is this relationship with this stepmother, his first one. And it's a bi-directional relationship. And then you have this other one with his stepmother, too, again, going down to him, kind of similar to his father, but not even touching him, which is amazing to see this. Thing. What's interesting is he had such a positive experience with his individual therapist, who was also someone like his, as his stepmother. So just looking at this wasn't even enough. Actually, he drew out, drawing out his whole family was very useful in kind of looking at all the different relationships and to see what, what happened in group. He had a very positive um, transference to the leaders. Um, and in the group, as you might expect, he had a hard time with other males in the group, a lot of um, uh, anger, a lot of issues around rage, um, uh, very defensive, but was very different with other members in the group. So it was really helpful to have this kind of a diagram to, to explore the dynamics in the group that would happen. The fearful patients are high in anxiety and high in avoidance. So this is the category here where they're high on both of them. Um, these are patients that are similar to the disorganized attachment that I talked about linked to kind of trauma. So these are patients who use both strategies. They're not just one. So they are often fearful of abandonment and rejection and can hyperactivate, but they also can withdraw to protect themselves. The fearful individuals tend to engage in both of them. As I said before, they're concerned with safety. Um, there may be dissociation to cope with overwhelming pain or stress or distress or trauma. They're fearful of abandonment and rejection, um, and they can't feel ordeal. They become so flooded. So this is a patient. Um, this is actually a patient that was in one of my, my groups, um, and this is outpatient. She's a 28-year-old white cisgender female who presented with history of trauma, was emotionally abused, neglected as a child. She was also a gifted pianist. She had many interpersonal difficulties that led her to um, be alone. She did not trust people and focused on academics where she excelled. And after mild suicidal ideation and depressive episodes, she entered outpatient treatment in both group and individual treatment. Um, group helped her stay connected, but it has been so challenging to help her tolerate her feelings in the group and hear others' pain. Often she projected negative intentions onto the leader and she engaged in uh, hyperactivating strategies like complaining about her pain and then deactivating strategies by missing a session the next week or not coming and leaving the group hanging. This is her diagram. This is what she wrote. Um, and I can't see the top of it, but um, I think it's, uh, I'll just start with number five because I can't read the top. It says here that children play different roles in your family. What role did you play? And she writes, I was the silent lump of meat who was brilliant academically and gifted musically, but not really a person. Here she says, describe your mother. My mom wants to try to love me, but when I lived at home, she was a vampire who sucked all the life out of me. Describe your father. My dad is well-meaning. When I lived at home, he was just there, always present, but not communication except through mom. And how did your parents show their anger at you? Well, if dad was mad, mom would tell me. If she was mad, she'd either stomp around or use blaming language. You don't love me. How did you express your anger? I would usually keep my anger inside like a pressure cooker. In high school, I would scream at my mother. And then she goes to draw the same type of drawing where she divides the paper into two parts. The first five years of her life when her sisters lived at home where she's very insignificant, almost in a different uh, medium where they're floating and she's underwater. 
the, there's no attachment, but there is the possibility of attachment is to mother and all the other siblings and dad is way over here. This is after her sisters leave. This is her mom and that she's a speck in her mom's universe and everyone else is on the outside, basically engulfed by her mother, right? So you can imagine this was so helpful because she had a lot of mistrust of me as the leader and often felt like I was intrusive, often perceived malevolent intentions that thinking I was being very critical or trying to be controlling. And it was very hard for her to trust me. She had an ability to trust other people in the group, but really struggled in the group. It was very difficult. And I would have only taken her in the group if she was also in individual therapy. But this is an example of how it can be useful in thinking about what happens in the group. Um, all of these examples are also highlighting how someone can have a major depressive disorder or, or a certain type of it and have a different attachment style. And I think it's important, and I'll talk a little bit more important as far as what the research findings are, is that different aspects of group help people differently because of their attachment and how the attachment relates to the symptom. So if a patient is more anxious, they may benefit from group cohesion because they're often depressed due to loneliness or more relational reasons that may be related to the depression. Um, if a person is more avoidant the struggle, they may benefit from cohesion in a different way because the depression is not as relational. They might be more depressed because they're not getting the praise, lacking the success or for more individual concern. So it's really important to kind of look at what is going on as far as how that attachment relate. And I'll share with you a really interesting study that actually found this. I thought it was a, one of the best studies to be looking at this in hospital setting. So here are some research findings. I try to make them fun. <laughs> um, I love research, so I think these are really important. But before we start, I wanted to ask a question, right, to make the, the research relevant. So. Who do you think is most likely to drop out of a therapy group? More securely attached members, more avoidantly attached members, or more anxiously attached members? What about attachment? So the research shows that greater avoidance is related to more dropping out of group psychotherapy. Um, and especially looking at outliers in groups. So um, Dennis Kivligan has done some really cool studies looking at the group as a whole and the different attachments within a group. And if someone is very high in attachment compared to everyone else in the group, but they're like an outlier on attachment avoidance, they're probably the most at risk in a group. So it's really important to have someone else in the group who also has some avoidance um, and also what he found is that if you have mixed groups, it's really helpful that people get the most out of having mixed attachments within the group. Um, Chen Malincott also found that high attachment buoyance was related to less group attraction. Um, they do not, um, they tend to, this is descriptive in their study, repelled by the pressure to be more intimate or group cohesion. So especially when the group is gelling and there's more intimacy, that may be when someone who's higher in avoidance is thinking about leaving the group and having a harder time with it. So more avoidance is also less gains in social support from the group. And I have the reference here. And if anyone wants these slides afterwards, you can, you're welcome to have my slides, but I have references throughout that I think would be, that are very interesting. Kivligan's work is really interesting. Um, this is the study I was talking about before Gallagher and Tasca. They found that um, in their research with eating disorders, they were looking at eating disorders and different attachments. And what they found was that the relationship between group cohesion, like increasing group cohesion and reducing binging only occurred in those who had higher attachment anxiety. And they, they suggest that the patients with higher attachment anxiety were using food to cope with their loneliness. And so if they had a more sense of belonging in the group, there was less loneliness and less isolation and the motivation to binge decreased. They did not find that effect for members who were, had attachment avoidance. So members who were more avoidantly attached used food to deal with the stress of their work or managing um, perfectionism or things like that. So being in a group didn't address the motivation to eat or the binging. So I think that is a really important finding is how attachment can help understand what component of the treatment will help the patient the most. Um, the other study I just put up too by Keating et al is a terrific study. Um, it's one of my favorites. 
with George Tasco's work as well, because what it shows is that you develop an attachment to your therapy group. And the stronger that attachment to this therapy group correlated with your attachment outside in your relationships with individuals, like important partners or romantic relationships, a year after group treatment ended. So that attachment that you develop within the group had a significant relationship on attachments that you have later. And he does short-term groups. So those are short-term groups as well. Um, the other important thing to look at is when you're leading groups is the attachment and the behaviors you'll see in the group. So if a leader can be aware of the member's attachment, they may be able to help them prepare for what may get played out in the group, right? So for more anxious individuals, they tend to be less assertive, sometimes more passive aggressive. They can be intrusive. Um, the ways that members ask questions, they focus a lot more on themselves can hinder the relationships. So in one of the APA videos I did, um, it was actually a, running a therapy group and, and the patient was very high in attachment anxiety. And the first thing she did was she came in and started talking about her hospitalizations, her eating disorders, a lot of her difficulties and really dominated the group. So it was really hard to kind of try to intervene. Um, but I think that's something that happens and that helps for, for leaders to be aware of. More avoiding group members scored the lowest on productive client behaviors um, and the highest on resistance, um, silence, and negative responses in a therapy group. So it's also really important research to be aware of. And this is my favorite is leader attachment. Um, because one of the things I think is like uh, the ideal place to do research, so this is what we need to do is in this area. So I'm going to start with therapists and individual therapy because there's not that much in group. But when it comes to individual therapy, there is research looking at attachment of the therapist. So therapists who are more secure tend to have a uh, stronger alliance, more effective use of countertransference. Oh. That means it's 1250. Um, effective use greater session depth and more empathic engagement. But uh, we also know with ruptures that uh, more secure therapists are able to deal with ruptures better in psychotherapy, whereas more therapists who are anxious tend to have worse ratings of empathy when other people watch how they handle the ruptures. So it's really also related to rupture and repair. So this is one of my questions for you too. Which leader attachment has the most negative impact on a group of people during a stressful time? That's like a raise. <laughs> it's really interesting. I would have thought the same thing, but the research is really interesting because there is um, no research in psychotherapy at all about this so far. I know people who are doing this research that hasn't been published. So in therapy, we don't really know, but we do know from other groups. So Davidovitz and McCollins are in Israel. They were doing, they wanted to look at this dynamic between um, member and leader. So what they did was military groups and basic training. So the basic training is very stressful. And they looked at the attachment of the leader, which would be um, the officer and the soldiers and the attachment styles of the soldiers. And basically found that the greater level of military avoidance, the less soldiers rated cohesion in the groups. And this is the biggest finding, right? The more avoidant distancing leaders had the most toxic effect on soldiers' mental health over time. And this is especially for more anxious soldiers. So if you had a soldier where you were anxious and you go into a stressful situation in a group and the leader is dismissing, no empathy, no support, not attuned, um, that's the worst situation. They were the ones who had the most deterioration and well-being right away. However, what you see is that the more secure soldiers are buffered. So at two months, they don't have the decline, right? So there's no difference. However, at four months, they too deteriorate in their sense of well-being at four months compared to any of the other groups. So if even if you are secure, if you are in a stressful situation, with a dismissing leader over time, who's not attuned and not supportive and not emotionally supportive, um, there's more deterioration than any other type of leader. 
right? We do need more of this. I think this is a timely uh, study as well, given the issues we're seeing in leaderships outside of group therapy, but in, in society. So I'm gonna go really quickly through this because I, I don't know if I talked slower or, uh, or talked lower because I'm running out of time. But there's a lot around group attachments and the attachments we have to other identities, right? At the group level. Um, and when you look at a hospital setting, you have a lot of different things impacting the group. You have the dyadic attachment from early life. You have their adult dyadic attachments. You have group attachments that include family, their religious identities, racial identities, ethnic identities. Then on top of that, you have systemic oppression, the culture and trauma that's going on outside, and then a relationships with group members, leaders, staff, and the unit. So all of this influencing what's happening in the group. And so what we want to look at, and I'm just going through this extremely fast so I give time for questions, is how is attachment related to some of these systemic issues, right? Like how does it relate? All groups, they're likely to have microaggressions and ruptures um, on the unit and both in the group or even in the unit, where the group is often a social microcosm of society. So we can expect there to be racism, sexism, a devaluation of religious identities or hate towards minority groups. Dennis Kivligan did research. They found that in, in all of the groups they were looking at, 71% of people revealed some kind of microaggression. Um, the group culture is what impacted how the group navigated the, the ruptures and attachment does as well. So we do know that with adult attachment security, it does relate to the ability to tolerate discrimination. So if you have a more secure attachment, it's easier to weather discrimination and hate. We also know that attachment insecurity is related to prejudice and discrimination. And the most fascinating research is with priming. So if you prime people with secure attachments, they will be more vulnerable about their bias and actual discriminating behavior and be less aggressive than if you prime them with a neutral. So by priming people, you actually are learning that if we can provide stability and safety, there's more ability to tolerate exploration of a painful rupture. Right. Um, I edited two editions in Group Dynamics and International Journal of Group Therapy, and I wanted to put that a plug for that because it is really important to be looking at, like, how do we train group therapists to deal with ruptures? So I'm going to end here with how we can facilitate groups as a secure base. A lot of it is about the leader and creating interventions that facilitate new scripts by the way they experience have in the group. And, um, that's about it. And these are some resources that I want to give you some time to ask questions if we do have any time. I think we have five minutes. So I hope that's good. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Marmarsh. Um, that was a wonderful presentation. We have some very positive feedback already. So if people do have questions, please type them into the Q&A box and we'll get to them as soon as we can. Um, I'll start off with one at least provocative question. So, you know, in the, in the last few slides, you... Um, presented data that suggests that the attachment style of the leader has important outcomes on patient outcomes. Um, and we in the mental health field don't typically screen leaders for psychopathology or attachment style or family history, family history of trauma, neglect, anything else. And so I'm interested in your thoughts on how powerful were the effects? Like, are they relatively small effect sizes that we're seeing? So it would be outlandish for anybody to suggest that we should be screening leaders somehow, or were these effect sizes actually quite significant and maybe suggestive that maybe we should, when we think about developing group psychotherapy programs in hospitals, we should be thinking about in the interview process, or maybe as a condition of doing this work, that we want to understand your attachment style or whatever, because it has material impact on whether the patients are going to get better or not. I think it's such a good question, Chris, because I, I think that question's come up a lot in the field of psychotherapy around um, what are the, the factors within a therapist that might influence their ability to do the work. Um, and that can change over time, right? Certainly, um, there are a lot of different factors that influence um, a therapist's competency to do the work. Um, 
I would suggest that attachment's one piece of that, but there are a lot of different things that come up. I think that the most important piece is the training and that in the training, people get the supervision they need to be aware of themselves. So what should happen as you become a therapist, whether it's a group therapist or individual therapist, is that you learn that you do impact the patients you work with and that to be an ethical therapist, you need to stay on top of what you bring to the process. So you should be, if you have trauma, if you have an illness that's causing you distress, and there are a lot of things that influence therapists' capacity to do the work, including their attachment. Sometimes it could be their attachment. Some could be that they're going through a very painful time in their life, or they have their own mental illness that they're dealing with on top of things. So therapists are people, leaders are people. They need to be on top of their bias, their their ability to tolerate privilege, to talk about um, difference, to tolerate conflict in group when people feel like there's a microaggression. And I think so therapists have a lot of hard work to do. And I actually think we need to do better at training them to be self-aware. I think you could screen people who are more open to self-exploration and working on themselves and are ethical psychologists, social workers, or nurse practitioners, or licensed counselors who know that they are going to be influencing their patients. So they need to be able to do the work and know when they can't do the work or they need to get help. But it's a good question, but I think it's a bigger one than just attachment. Okay, great. Um, The next question, uh, can you comment on the issue of attachment at the level of families when children are hospitalized? <clears throat> Such an interesting one. Um, I think, you know, that's one of the biggest struggles I had when I worked on the inpatient unit was seeing the children have all the symptoms, but then having to, and not being able to change the family. And then they would get discharged and go back into a family that was really either chaotic or traumatizing and kind of feel like I couldn't stop that. So I really feel like it's important systemically to look at trying to look at how uh, there's a lot of things going on in a family. So I think it does influence the treatment so that when you're working with a child who's hospitalized, that you try to work with the family to get help as well. Um, Even if the family, you know, say the family isn't have anything to do with the onset of the illness, they still are impacted by it. It impacts the siblings, it impacts the, the parents. So I do think they need to get support if that's kind of the question is that family therapy can be really helpful. I do think it helps to have an idea about an attachment because you could kind of look at like, does the child feel like they can rely on their parents as a secure base when they're distressed? Do they feel like they can get the support they need? You know, Is there abuse or some kind of trauma within the family that needs to get addressed? So I do think attachment can be very helpful. Great. A couple of people have asked uh, <clears throat> whether it's possible to get the slides or not. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I don't know if that's something that I am happy to. I'm going to. I have a version that I can send you that doesn't have the clinical material in it. It just takes great. out the few slides that I had the patients post about. That would be great. So if yeah, if, if you share that with Marge Overheiser, and then for the people who have requested a copy of that. PDF or whatever it will be, um, we'll, I'll ask you to email Marge Overheiser maybe in a day or two after we've received it, and then uh, she can send it your way. And then the last thing I'll share before we close is just um, a, a, a quite um, uh, um, unusual compliment. I have to run, but this was one of the very best grand rounds useful, focused, nuanced relevance that I have attended at McLean in the past 15 years. So helpful. Thank you. So, um, (laughs) (laughs) thank you. You had a plan clearly, but (laughs) (laughs) wonderful. (laughs) Wonderful. So thank you so much, Dr. Marash. That was, um, absolutely wonderful and, uh, really a great tribute to Dr. Powers and all the work he's done as well. So, um, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you so much for having me. All right. Bye, all.